I want to start by saying growing up in Santa Cruz, I was pretty much a regular at the Del Mar Theater for Saturday matinees. I ate a lot of popcorn where I, when I watched so many Western movies. And little did I know, how is the sound by the way? Sound fine? Little did I know that Hollywood was feeding me and everyone else with this pretty steady diet of misconceptions, myths, um, and um, really falsehoods about indigenous people. And adding to that sort of decades on celluloid of misinformation, when I became an educator, I was actually stunned at how US history textbooks, that was my field, how US history textbooks, whether at the elementary level or the secondary level, so left out um, the culture, the experiences of Native Americans. And so the question is, how does, how do those myths get debunked? How do, the falsehoods really get buried. And the only way that can happen is with true history. And that's what this book, as you see up there, that's what Martin does with this book. But true history alone will not debunk the myths. I know that firsthand. Um, um, really um, getting a myth to get out of the collective consciousness is extraordinarily hard work. But Martin has made it much, much better than I've ever experienced it before, and I want to tell you how. But for example, in terms of a myth, I recently was told by an actually award-winning local historian I just don't want to believe that many of the Padres could have been that cruel to the indigenous population. So the operative words there, I just don't want to believe. So this book, what Martin has done here in the most extraordinary way um, is to make it almost impossible to dismiss the true story. So how has he done that? Well, so when Martin asked me, he goes, will you review the last two chapters for me before it goes to press, just to catch anything, you know, you need to have so many eyes on a book like this. And I said, sure, I would be glad to, um, I'd be glad to help. So I get the draft and I'm, I think, oh, well, I'll go to the end where the last two chapters are. But that is not the case. Ch the last chapter ends here in the middle of the book. Okay? So what's the whole second half of the book, right? The second half of the book is the verification, the indisputable verification of the stories that have been told in this book. All right, does anyone have a remote guess of how many citations are in this book? I actually counted them this morning. I don't even know, do you know? He doesn't know. Okay, so anybody have a guess? There are 1,649 citations in this book. So I said to Martin, I go, well, I mean, I'm just flabbergasted because in my years of working in academia, I'd never seen a book with this many um, endnotes. I go, at what moment did you realize that you were so talented as a scholar? And he started laughing and said, well, I was really never thought of myself as a student. I didn't think of myself as serious in terms of um, you know, taking college classes seriously. He even said when he was at Cabrillo, he was pretty bored. But that all changed when he started taking classes from Stan Rushworth. Stan? So 
I, I, I hear this applause. How many of you are former students of Stan? Wow, thank you for being here. Very cool. So um, what Martin said is that taking these classes from Stan, who, by the way, taught Native American literature and culture um, at Cabrillo for 30 years, taking these classes transformed him. And he was like, that's who I want to be when I grow up, right? And so it was, I want to be someone who writes about and teaches about Native American history. And so from Cabrillo and having to go back and take a whole lot more classes now that he had his focus, from there he went to UC Santa Cruz where he got his PhD and began this momentous, incredible journey. So with that, I want to tell you, because you're all already asking Martin and me, how can you get a copy of this book, right? You all want to know how you can get a copy. Well, thanks to Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks, Bonnie Holly, hi, Bonnie. Um, they've made it possible for you to buy the book locally at a 40% discount. So you go to that'smypark.org, easy to do, order it online or you go up to the mission, to the Santa Cruz Historic Park mission, to the wonderful bookstore there and buy it there. And this copy, the History Forum is giving to the Ma Archive, so it's accessible. You can just make a, an appointment and go in and read it in the archive if you would like to. So with that, I would like to extend a very warm and exciting welcome to the um, California State Parks historian for the Santa Cruz District, Dr. Martin Riso Martinez. Well, thank you, Tracy. Uh, how's the sound? Sound okay? Everyone can hear? Okay. A little closer? Okay. Here we go. Uh, so thank you, Tracy, for that. That was wonderful. Um, and thank you to the Ma for, for hosting this. Uh, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure to, to be here as I fiddle with this. Does that sound still, is it good? We're good? Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'm gonna tell you a couple stories from the book uh, that I'll share with you here, but I uh, wanna say a couple things just to kind of uh, start too. I think, I think one of the things that I wanna say to people is that, uh, I think if you if you're interested in reading this book, that's great. And I think there's you know obviously Tracy did a really much better job of kind of telling you a little bit about it. But I also want to encourage you to if you're interested in the topic, if you're interested in learning more about Native people, um, there are a lot of great things out there. And I, I view my book as being complementary to uh, particularly the the many books that are being written by Native Californians that tell you know very firsthand accounts. One that comes to mind locally is. Uh, Deborah Miranda's uh, Bad Indians, uh, but there's many others. Uh, Stan has a really great collection that's coming out next month, uh, which includes interviews with, uh, I think, 20 different Native people uh, from many from around here, but other places. Uh, so I just want to encourage you to look for those because there's just tremendous scholarship right now uh, that is coming out, especially from Native Californian scholars uh, and community members. So um, anyway, just kind of a word on that. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, this question of what was here before Spanish colonialism, right? What was in the Santa Cruz area, in this larger Bay Area here? Um, and when the when the Spanish arrived here in 1760s, they arrived to a place where there was already an extremely sophisticated society uh, that was here. Um, there was a society that was interconnected through economic relations, through trade. Uh, trade ties going up and down, uh, through social and political ties, uh, through spiritual societies where people would come across uh, from different tribes and get together and you know share ceremonies and prayers, um, and it was a it was a very sophisticated place, and it's worth noting that the the project of colonialism itself right involves people moving into an area that they're not familiar with, and it involves projecting onto the people there, right? This is at least historically how colonialism has worked. So when the Spanish arrived and later, uh, you know, Mexican and then U.S. Uh, colonialism that, that took place here, 
Um, but when they arrived, they they failed to recognize the sophistication of the, of the society that was here, uh, and that that much is really clear now. And we're we're just today, I think, as a society, starting to appreciate, for example, the sophisticated land management techniques uh, that were being employed by Native peoples and had been, you know, discovered and kind of uh, refined over millennia. Um, and you know, the Spanish arrived here, and uh, you know, a part of this colonialism is to consider things as you know, uh, an untapped wilderness, right? They saw like a, a natural bounty of things. And now we understand that that was only the case because people took care of those lands, because they they had, uh, you know, specific ways that they tended to the wilderness. Uh, you know, this idea of a wilderness is a mythology, of course. Um, and th these were, you know, well-tended gardens that were up here. Um, so I think it's important that people understand that because the mythologies that have been taught on this uh, run deep and they, they tend to, you know, try to tell a story where, uh, you know, the Spanish colonials, the missionaries arrived here and the native people, uh, you know, did not have sophistication and learned it from the missions, which of course couldn't be further from the truth. Um, so this is a map. I'm going to show a couple maps that are from the book. And these were written, this one was actually uh, kind of built from uh, Amamutsin tribal uh, historian, Ed Ketchum, who I worked very closely with, but he had created this uh, I think really a fantastic map that kind of gives a sense of the native geographies uh, of the area. Uh, Santa Cruz, Mission Santa Cruz was founded in 1791. Um, this map here basically shows, uh, this was a map that was uh, suggested by tribal, uh, Amamutsin tribal chair Valentin Lopez uh, had said, hey, maybe we can make a map that that look specifically at the tribes that ended up at Mission Santa Cruz, right? And so uh, I think it's a great idea and it gives a sense of where uh, the impact on Native people were. Um, but at Mission Santa Cruz during the duration while Mission Santa Cruz is running, there was about 35 independent tribes uh, who ended up coming into the area. Uh, and the, the ways that they did is, you know, ranged from, you know, early points where people were coming in out of curiosity uh, to later points where it was more militaristic uh, and more forcibly removal, uh, especially with the tribes that are on the east there. Um, but what we see here is that there was a diversity of different uh, tribes, different groups uh, that all ended up at Mission Santa Cruz. Uh, the closest of the tribes that are right next to where Santa Cruz is were the Awaswa speaking Ohlone people. Uh, and then over the hill where you see Unahaima and Ausaima, uh, that was kind of the Mutsun Ohlone speaking area. Um, and then once you get out to that last kind of sphere where those were uh, the Yokuts peoples who lived out in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, very distinct, you know, uh, historically different histories, different language, uh, everything. Uh, but people found themselves kind of thrust into this, uh, this mission world where they were, uh, you know, new ideas were being imposed upon them from everything, right? Uh, absolutely every aspect of their lives uh, at that point. So, um, one more map, and I'll come back to this one later too, but this is another map uh, showing kind of a, a sense of tribal territories uh, around here. And you'll see things like um, the Aptos, the Aptos tribe lived just south of here. Uh, of course, we still have the town of Aptos that's named after them. Uh, Sayanta was a village kind of up, up in the San Lorenzo uh, watersheds. And, uh, and that, of course, Zianti today is named after. Um, and then another notable name that kind of survived into the time is uh, the chief of the Uipi. The Uipi tribe lived here in Santa Cruz, downtown area. Uh, but the chief of the Uipi tribe was a fellow named Sokel, uh, which you might recognize that name. But of course, it's kind of been, you know, people don't know where that comes from, but it actually came from the chief who was here. So, um, yeah, I think I uh, just kind of want to give that map, uh, but start with a, a little bit of context before I get into the specific story that I'm going to share with you. Um, but I've, I've talked about these numbers a little bit. I think it's uh, important for people to understand when we're looking at the, the history here and what was life at the missions for Native people. Uh, I think that we have to understand this, uh, first of all, within the context of great loss uh, and difficulty that people were enduring. Um, this chart here is a chart that I made uh, looking at different missions, looking at the number of baptisms, the numbers of burials, uh, trying to understand <clears throat> how many people survived through these years. 
Uh, and you see Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista are kind of the closest ones up here. Um, and what we see at Santa Cruz is that by the time the mission closed uh, in the late 1830s, uh, over 90% of the people who had been baptized there had died uh, in that period. So less than 10% had survived. Um, and this is even right after then a smallpox epidemic came through and killed some more people. Uh, so those numbers actually got worse. But I think this is really important. Of course, it's worth saying that, you know, Native people here were not numbers. Um, they are much more than that. They were people with, you know, lives and families. Um, but it, you have to understand just the circumstances of great loss. And I think in the story I'm going to share with you today, uh, you'll see specifically kind of an example of how that played out uh, with one person's life. One other aspect, uh, kind of a more on the demographic side of things, but again, it helps us understand this. But when I looked at uh, the number of births, you know, the, the native babies that were born uh, to families at the mission, Mission Santa Cruz, um, there was just under 471 uh, total babies that were born, uh, which is, you know, just under 500. Uh, and I tried to look at the inform infant mortality numbers to try to understand, like, how long were they surviving? Uh, and the numbers are devastating. So it was over 50% of the babies born uh, at Mission Santa Cruz who did not survive to the age of one, and then an over 25% who died before the age of five. So over 75% of the babies who were born here did not survive past infancy, right? Um, and this is not even when they talk about infant mortality numbers, usually they look at like 16, 17. Uh, and these numbers are, are really, you know, I did look, it's worth mentioning, but I did look at the archeological records we have of burial sites that were pre-contact in the Bay Area. And the infant mortality numbers are almost inverse of that. Uh, it's about 80% of the people survived to adulthood uh, before the missions were here. So this idea that the missions brought uh, anything of, in terms of health or well-being for native people is, is an absolute myth. I mean, it's, it's an re exact reversal of what was happening before uh, the missionaries got here. Okay, um, I wanna start with that because I think it's, it's important and you'll see as the story uh, unfolds how that impacted what we're gonna talk about here. So the story I wanna share with you, uh, this comes from, I believe it's the sixth chapter of my book, but um, it really starts in 17, uh, 1773, that's a typo uh, on that, but December 27, 1773, or I'm sorry, that would be 1873. Anyway, that's a total typo on that. Uh, my, my apologies, the book's uh, more well proofread than my presentation, so bear with me. Um, but the story starts in 1873 when uh, a fellow named, uh, who went by the name of Justiniano Rojas, um, and he ended up at uh, the Sister of Mercy Hospital. Uh, and this was a hospital that was over on Mission Hill by kind of where the, the old school was up there. Um, and he ended up uh, at the hospital for some reason. His health was uh, failing him. And so a reporter goes by there uh, to kind of hear this story. And rumor starts going out there as the reporter uh, starts to uh, trying to ask the question of who is this guy? Who's Rojas? Uh, how old is he? Right. And uh, as you can see from I'll show you some pictures, too. Um, you know, we now know and I, I'm going to tell you the real story of Rojas, but we now know he was in his 80s at the time. Uh, but the missionary uh, who was there, Father Joaquin Adam, uh, ended up looking through the mission registers. And what, what they didn't realize at the time is that names were often given. So the process of baptism at Mission Santa Cruz involved um, not only baptizing people, but then giving them new names. Uh, they'd often record their native names, but then they'd give them a new name that they, you know, a Spanish name uh, on top of that. And so in the case of the name Justiniano Rojas, uh, there was another guy who had been baptized there very early on, who was a 40-year-old man who arrived in like 1793 uh, and had uh, and had been baptized by the name of Justiniano Rojas. And so they thought, well, this must be the same guy. And they did the math and said, well, that means that he's going to be 121 right now, uh, <laughs> according to this. So they didn't stop and think, well, what happened with this? And uh, I should note that a couple of historians have worked on this uh, story a couple of times. Uh, Robert Jackson and then local historian Jeff Dunn have both written about this. And what Jackson found in the 80s, when he traced out the life of this, this Rojas who had you know, been baptized so early, he realized he died a couple of years later. 
Uh, so it couldn't have been the same person, but they didn't, they didn't realize this at the time. They, uh, it fits kind of the, the mythology that they were looking for. Uh, and so in this particular article, they, uh, they, they say, they describe Rojas as being uh, old time Rojas, the oldest inhabitant of the earth. <laughs> and uh, they attribute his longevity and the life that he's living to the uh, climate of Santa Cruz, right? And so we have to understand this in the time of kind of boosters, right? People are trying to encourage people to move to California, right? To, uh, to move to Santa Cruz like this. And so, so this is part of the narrative that comes up at this point, right? Is that, um, that these ancient Indians who live here, right? Live, uh, you know, because of the, the weather that's out here. Um, in the article, they cited the evidence I mentioned about this baptismal record as proof that he was indeed 121 years old. Uh, and I'm going to read you a, a small clip from us because I think it's important to understand kind of the, the language that was used around this time. Uh, but from this article, it says in there, it says, Rojas, uh, and I quote here, Rojas is about as destitute of flesh as a skeleton. The skin is yellow, hard, full of creases, and looks like parchment. His little gray eyes were gummy and repulsive. This is in the newspaper article, right, talking about Rojas is this old man it says altogether Rojas looks like a mummy summoned from the cold uh, precincts of the grave to mock humanity. So I think this is important. You know, one of the themes that I deal with in the book uh, that I won't get into here, uh, but the, the process of the missions and stuff were, were very dehumanizing, right? I think that's the, the characteristic when we read the oral histories from Native people all the time, they're recognizing that they are being treated as, as livestock right, at the missions. And I think that this continues right into the American era where, where it's being written about with this kind of uh, language, right, uh, very dehumanizing. Um, but this article that comes out uh, ends up launching a whole mythology around Rojas uh, and all sorts of things. And I'll, I'll get into that before I tell you the, the real story of him. So, uh, in the making of this article, they actually had uh, Edward Payson Butler take a photograph of him. And this is one, uh, it's in the Moz collections, uh, as a lot of these old photos are. Um, but this, you know, this interest in him kind of uh, spurred on, uh, you know, this, this uh, you know, getting a photograph of him so that he could be publicized, right? Um, and so this photo was taken. Um, and uh, then there's a couple more. So I want to share a couple photographs here. This first one was by Butler. Uh, Butler was a proprietor of the Pioneer Gallery at the corner of Pacific Avenue and Locust Street. Uh, so not too far from here, downtown Santa Cruz. Uh, and they commissioned this one. And then about a year later, uh, in September of 1874, there's a second photograph that's taken uh, of Rojas. Uh, now, I should note that this one, this is a photograph that was just recently found in the Ma collections within the last year. Uh, so uh, in Jeffrey Dunn's article, he actually uh, didn't know about this. He talked a lot about like where were the, the missing photographs and stuff. So uh, I should also point out that it's a stereograph image, right? And so for those unfamiliar, um, these were kind of uh, early entertainments, right? It was like you have the dual, vi uh, dual pictures that you can put into a little machine and click on it, right? It was kind of an entertainment thing. So you see like a three-dimensional uh, thing. And I think it's worth noting because... That's as you'll see here as I give these other examples, like uh, the story of Rojas kind of becomes this entertainment thing, right? It's a, it's a, again a marketing uh, tool of early Santa Cruz uh, society here. Um, so this photo is taken by uh, John Elijah Davis Baldwin, who's the owner of the Star Gallery, Gallery which is another, uh, another place on Pacific Avenue. Um, and again, at this point, they think he's 122 years old. Uh, but a copy of this photo is actually sent to the Vatican at that point. Um, and, uh, and then this is when it really starts to kind of become, uh, get spread more, more widely, right? Outside of California here. Um, you know, uh, just a quick note on that in this article is interesting, but it sounds like he's still at the Sisters of Mercy. So he's still struggling with his health kind of in and out of, uh, you know, in and out of this hospital there. Um, and it's interesting because they, they also say in this article that he was married, uh, and widowed based on his baptismal records. And I, I think that's important because even here, Rojas is there, right? I mean, they're not asking him 
what his story was, who he was married to, what happened to him. It's they're looking into the baptismal books as the authority, right? Uh, and I think it's important to note that the church, in many ways today, continues to be the authority on you know these images of uh, native people or these records, right, uh, that are kept at the church. So uh, again, at this one, it's they're relying on the church account, even over like asking him, "Hey, what's your story?" and you know what what happened. Um, so, uh, and then Rojas ends up dying a little bit later, six months later in March of 1875. Um, but his legacy goes on and becomes much larger, uh, even after his death. So in Harper, uh, Harper's Weekly, which is a huge kind of, uh, you know, magazine that gets distributed nationally back in the 1870s, uh, for many years. Um, but they carry a story, uh, and you can see this is a drawing that's done from that first picture, right? So it's interesting how these photos go, uh, or these images. But this, uh, the story basically mirrors his, uh, um, his obituary, but this uh, gets out there in a, in a wide-ranging area, and it's reprinted in many different uh, local newspapers, including newspapers like in Australia, who are replicating this story, right? So this idea of this oldest man you know, ever, Rojas, um, is, is kind of being sent out in a wide way at the time. Um, a couple of years later, four years later, uh, this illustration appears. Now, this is, again, illustrated from the other photo uh, of him, but this one appears in um, uh, Wallace W. Elliott's Illustrations of Santa Cruz uh, County, which is published in 1879. Um, and, uh, you know, with a little blurb under it, kind of repeating the same story, right? Repeating this idea of this ancient uh, Rojas as well. Uh, and then the uh, the padre or the father, Father Adam over at Mission Santa Cruz or uh, what becomes Holy Cross, uh, he ends up uh, painting a portrait of Rojas that, uh, now this is just a, a photo from Ma's collection said uh, from a first Friday uh, a while back where they actually had uh, this painting on uh, display here, but the painting itself is still uh, out there. You can, if you go to the reliquary, which is the kind of uh, small model of Mission Santa Cruz up on the plaza there, but there's a little museum there. Uh, and this, this photo, the one on the left there, uh, this painting, uh, is still on display over there that you can see. But this painting uh, actually gets sent to, um, to the uh, 1893 uh, Chicago uh, Exposition, right? the Sh Chicago World's Fair, very famous one, kind of an infamous one actually for a lot of reasons. Uh, just you know, This is where they have human exhibits displayed and kind of from darkest to lightest, and it was a celebration of kind of white supremacy very much uh, that's going out to people. But uh, this painting gets displayed there in the California room on the south side of the, uh, of the exhibit. Um, so again, the painting gets out there. I think a copy of it also gets sent to, uh, of the painting gets sent to the Vatican as well. Um, interesting stuff. So uh, in 1890, there's a little article that's written by a fellow named E.L. Williams. E.L. Williams is a Santa Cruz historian uh, who moved into the the county in 1850s, 1851. Uh, and this is a really interesting article because he's reflecting on Rojas. Uh, he remembers meeting him in 1851 and learning about him. And then this other guy, Mariano, and a couple other, uh, Isidro, Sousa, you know, some of the older native community who are in the area in the 1850s. Uh, so he talks about that and he adds a little more information. He actually claims that it was T.W. Wright. Uh, was a journalist for the Sentinel, and he says that he's the one who made the discovery about he uh, his age, uh, and went you know, and then led him to get photographed. Uh, and then there's a quote from here, uh, as you can see here, it says, "I asked Mr. Wright uh, soon after if Hustiniano knew his own age, uh, or how he had obtained the knowledge of it. He answered that Hustiniano did not know his age, uh, but the, the baptismal register, the mission church." Have been searched and have been found that the uh, that he'd been baptized 80 years ago the same name. Uh, so again, I mean, at least it does sound like they're asking him at some point uh, here, but they're they're not really you know finding things. They're they're finding again this fantasy that reinforces what they want to believe of this. Uh, and again, here the church is the authority. You'll notice uh, in this story here. Um, another couple tidbits from this, but it turns out uh, Williams notes that Rojas was part of the mission choir. Uh, for those who know a little local history, uh, Lorenzo Asisada is probably the most famous 
uh, person coming from Mission Santa Cruz. He gave interviews uh, in the 1870s and 80s, uh, but he was also part of the choir. So they had known each other uh, clearly through this, including uh, there's another guy, Ricardo, who was the song leader for the, uh, the Mission Choir. And he actually ended up living, he was the last native person to own lands uh, by the Mission, uh, which he owned until the 1860s. Uh, when he ended up losing that land. Um, okay, moving on. Oh. Hold on. Okay, that's better. Um, so, oh, that didn't turn. So at some point, just kind of adding on what also happens with the story of Rojas before we turn to the real story of Rojas, um, but there, at some point in the early uh, 1900s, um, Chester A. Wood uh, in the, uh, there was a group called the Improved Order of the Red Men. Uh, I should note, this is a kind of white male uh, group. It's not, you know, it's this fraternity of the Red Men, but it's, you know, all white people who are in this group organization. Um, and they make a plaque. So over at the Holy Cross Cemetery, this is uh, a couple of images of that plaque that's there. Uh, now, my understanding is that his body is not there, that it was buried at the church, was so with all the other bodies that were uh, in an unmarked grave. But apparently they put a headstone there uh, to kind of symbolize this. Uh, there's, a, there's a street in town also called Rojas that's uh, named after uh, Rojas as well. Um, and then in the 1950s, um, well, we'll come to this in a second. But in the 1950s, uh, a local historian, uh, Margaret Koch, um, she brings Rojas back, right, and starts writing about him in the 50s. Uh, and she even has the Santa Cruz Board of Supervisors uh, declare Rojas an honorary chief of the Costanoan tribe. Uh, for those who know, Costanoan is the kind of uh, Spanish word that gets put on Bay Area native peoples, uh, meaning just coastal people, of course. Uh, this is a name that is anthropologists use for, for uh, now we consider Ohlone or by their own names, um, this group of people. So anyway, so the city council uh, board of supervisors declares him an honorary chief of the Coast Nolan tribe uh, in 1958. Uh, and then this is a, a brochure from 1967 uh, from the pageant of pioneers, uh, which has a bunch of uh, kind of people acting as different famous figures from Santa Cruz history. Um, and in Santa Cruz, or that Rojas, I should say, is played uh, by Malio Stagnaro, right? And this is the famous Stagnaro family, right, from, uh, from uh, you know, the, the fish, fisheries and stuff. Um, but so this is a picture, this is kind of part of that press from uh, this, uh, this big event, the pageant, right, um, where he's plays them. So you can see here that the story of Rojas is kind of like really tightly wound into kind of Santa Cruz history and like the history as people know this. Um, Koch also included a, a mention of him, a whole section of him in her book, uh, Santa Cruz County Parade of the Past, which is a really famous kind of uh, Santa Cruz history book. It came out in the 70s. Um, so let me switch here from this story to talk about the larger issue of this, right? So. Uh, I did uh, some research with a friend of mine. We are co-writing an article about this, but uh, we ended up uh, looking at different cities in, Santa, or in California. And what we found is that pretty much every city or just about has their own version of Rojas, right? There's old Gabriel or there's, you know, old Fernando. And, and, these, and they're, they're almost always the same thing. They're, they're ancient people. Um, this is actually from a book of the history of Sonoma County. Uh, and these images, I broke them down, but they're on the same page. Uh, and if you notice, yeah, on the left one, it says, Fernando, the last of the Soto Yome Indians, was 129 years old at his death. Uh, and then the next picture over there says, Fernando, his children, and his grandchildren. So literally, on the same page, people are, are talking about him as the last of his kind, pictured with his grandchildren, right? So... Clearly, the, the fixation on this fantasy of ancient Indians and the, the vanishing Indian, right, these people who are disappearing, uh, it's not about Native people, right? It's, it, has, it tells us a lot more about uh, American fantasies and projections about these vanishing Indians. Uh, it tells us about the justification of colonial occupation and genocide, 
Uh, you know, at this time period, uh, scalp bounties are being reimbursed in California. Uh, Native people are, uh, militias are being reimbursed to hunt them down. Uh, so this is a time in the early American era was very much a time of state sanctioned uh, and supported genocide, right? Um, so these myths kind of help justify this, right? Uh, they, they fixate on these false stories of inevitable extinction, right? It's this, this idea that this is always going to happen. There, it's a dying race. Uh, this is, you know, basically what, what these stories are. Um, and so let's shift now and talk about the actual real story. And I think what I'm trying to argue here is that these, these, these mythologies, these ideas of kind of, you know, vanishing Indians and native peoples, uh, they, the, the real stories are much more compelling, right? Uh, they, to actually understand the history of Rojas, uh, tells us a lot. So first of all, you know, Rojas was, uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll say a note on this. Uh, when when I mentioned um, Robert Jackson and Jeff Dunn had written about this story a couple times, and their conclusion uh, on this after talking about it with each other was that we'll probably never know who he was. Uh, and and it was, it's tricky to figure it out. And I what I was able to figure out is I was when I traced through in my methodology throughout the book is to trace through um, looking at kinship networks, looking at families, extended families, and all these things. And when I traced that out. Um, what I found was that there is a uh, aunt of this one guy who's listed as Hostiano in the baptismal book, um, and uh, his native name was Irachis. Um, but he, uh, I found in one of the, the his aunt's baptisms that was recorded, uh, I think, 13 years after his own baptism, there's a reference to him as her her niece or nephew uh, with the name Hostiniano, right? And so there's you see that this kind of shifting happens with people's names in these records at the time. Uh, and so uh, this was, you know, uh, along with everything else that kind of matched up, it helped me realize, okay, he also went by Hostiniano as well as uh, Host Hostiano uh, too. So, um, so this is just a, a little bit of info on him, but his story is this. Uh, Irachis was born around 1788 in uh, a village called Chipuktak, uh, which is just northeast of the modern day town of Gilroy. Um, and, you know, the Chipuktak village, which uh, there were native people who were sent from uh, there to Mission Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. And this is really common where uh, particular tribes, and as, as you'll see with this group I'm talking about, um, the Yausaima people, uh, they were particularly rebellious, right? They were known for fighting back, resisting colonialism. Uh, and so this is a tribe that got split between different missions. Uh, and again, this is a tactic that would happen quite a bit, right? Especially with, with tribes that were, uh, who, were, who were fighting back. Um, but the, the Chipuktak village is in, a, uh, in the area of the tribe called the Ausaima. Uh, the Ausaima, the word Ause, in, uh, in the Mutsun language means salt, right? And so the Ausaima were the salt people. Uh, and there actually are some uh, salt reserves in that area. Um, and in fact, there's some letters from the Spanish talk about uh, kind of the Ausaima fighting with the Spanish over some of these salt reserves uh, during that time period. Uh, there's some really cool stories. The Ausaima, um, before Mission San Juan Batista was founded in 1798, uh, when the Spanish tried to travel through that area, there's letters saying that the Ausaima would charge them tribute, right? So they make the Spanish pay to pass through their lands, um, which is, is pretty cool to see. Um, but they also, the Ausaima were, like I said, they were known for fighting back. And part of this was that they, they became a haven for fugitives. So native people who were leaving the missions uh, from all sorts of neighboring missions would end up in that area. And there's all sorts of uh, letters of kind of battles, soldiers being sent into Ausaima lands, trying to get back these fugitives, uh, and this back and forth there. Um, so. Uh, his people were, were definitely really fascinating in and of their own right, the Ausaima. Um, and I'll, I'll put up this map so you can see. Uh, you can see right there is where the Ausaima territory was over there, uh, just over the hill, uh, in kind of just north of uh, where Mission San Juan Batista eventually was, uh, which is Mutsun territories. Um, so let's see. So that's the Ausaima. Um, you know, trying to piece together, you know, the question of when did uh, Irachis arrive at the mission and what was his story? Um, you know, he arrives in the winter of 1795. Uh, and this was a, a particularly cold, wet winter. 
Um, so it's possible that his family came there in search of a uh, steady source of food. Uh, when I looked at people coming into the mission, a lot of times in the winter months, people arrived in larger numbers um, for these reasons, uh, partly because of the impact on trade networks and the availability of foods. Uh, a lot of the foods that Native people were getting were from like the, the fields, uh, right, where grasses and different types of foods, but these are being destroyed by livestock. Uh, by agricultural fields that are put, being kind of tilled in where they where those places were, um, so it's possible it was, it was starving. Another possible uh, lead to this might have been uh, this one padre, Padre Manuel Fernandez, uh, who was at Mission Santa Cruz in this time period. Late, uh, he had arrived 1795. He gets sent to Mission Santa Cruz because he's at Santa Clara, uh, and there's an incident where he basically is threatening to burn down a village if people don't convert. Uh, and get baptized, and he beats like a, a crippled man. Uh, and this is a report that soldiers are writing about this Fernandez, and they're like, they're like, wow, you know, like now they're arming themselves to fight us as at Santa Clara, right? Uh, they're like, we can't. This this padre is out of control, right? So what do they do? They send him into Mission Santa Cruz because Mission Santa Cruz is a little bit smaller, I think, and a little more remote. Um, but the same thing happens here, and there's some letters about him doing the same thing over at uh, like Ipahra, right? So over by the river there, uh, down in the Watsonville area. So is it possible that, you know, maybe this is part of why Irachis and his family uh, end up here? It could be part of this, uh, you know, uh, fallout from Fernandez, um, but we don't really know for sure. Uh, but we do know that he and his family uh, end up basically coming all the way over from their lands, uh, relocating to Mission Santa Cruz. And this happens in uh, January of 1796. And um, again, I, I mentioned that he's baptized with the name Ostiano, but he arrives as one of 33, uh, mostly infants and children uh, from the Chapuktak village. They're all baptized on this day uh, in a mass ceremony. And this includes, uh, he has five siblings and his parents are named Tayup and Murahate. Uh, and so he arrives there. He, Arachis would have been eight years old at the time of his arrival there. And so... Uh, his family, you know, when I traced out what happened to all of his family, uh, it appears that they didn't like being at the mission either. And so actually four of his siblings are uh, enumerated as uh, having died while fugitive, right? I mentioned before, a lot of people leave the missions or fleeing them. Uh, and this is happening ongoing. Um, but what they would do is they would, when they got word that somebody had died, they put that in the books, you know, reported as, you know, died while fugitive. Uh, and so the, with the large numbers of his family uh, ending up this way, I think it's, it's a question I have is, you know, do, where was he in this? You know, had he also left? Did he decide to come back to the mission after some of his family members died and he knew he had other kin over here at uh, Santa Cruz Mission that he could go to? Uh, it's possible that. Uh, the other thing is that his, the one surviving sibling, so basically his whole family within a couple of years uh, all die after arriving at the mission. Uh, but he had one brother, uh, his older brother, who is named Sente, uh, who is bapti baptized as Proyecto, uh, who is also there with him. Uh, and Proyecto, you know, his story is interesting because it it, it connects with, um, you know, what a lot of the, the young kind of children at the missions were. And they were like finding ways to get involved with kind of uh, the, the life at the missions. And Sente is somebody who, uh, he becomes, this is his brother, uh, he quickly becomes a marriage witness to marriages. Uh, he becomes a godparent, uh, and he marries uh, a woman who uh, is also becomes one of the prominent kind of uh, godmothers there. And so, you know, when during the baptism, like when uh, they're given like a godparent, godmother, godfather, um, but in many ways, this is a way to kind of build new kinship ties, right? And to build uh, community in this uh, situation. Again, think about his life and others. I mean, they're seeing most of their family dying off very quickly here, right? So people are trying to find ways uh, to build these connections and these ties. Um, I should, uh, you know, one interesting thing about the story too is that, uh, you know, when he married, uh, so let's see, I'm gonna skip that story. Let's not get into that. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of stories here to cover. So it's picking and choosing which ones. Um, so, uh, well, one side thing is that uh, the niece of his brother, uh, or Irachi's niece, I should say, the daughter of uh, Sente is a woman named Antonina, uh, and she died at the age of 21 uh, at the mission there. And uh, what's what I find particularly interesting and uh, a little concerning is that there's, there's a very elaborate note in her burial record, uh, and it's by one of the padres here, um, 
And Padre is uh, named Gil Itabuada, Luis Gil Itabuada. And, uh, and he leaves this really kind of, um, you know, extremely long notes about, you know, what a tragedy it was. Uh, but the way he talks about her too is a little, um, a little strange. And, and part of it is the context of Gil Itabuada. Uh, Gil Itabuada was a Padre who, uh, according to the oral histories of Asisara, he was well liked uh, by some because he went and played games like gambling games with native men. Uh, he learned the language. Um, but Asisara also points out that he also had a fondness for native women. Uh, he says, quote, he was very amorous. This is Asisara in the oral history talking about him. He says he was very amorous. He hugged and kissed the Indian women and he, he had contact with them until he had syphilis and skin eruptions broke out. <laughs> so there are lots of stories of priests and others passing syphilis to native women. Uh, this is one of those priests who like very clearly has a story. Uh, so it, we don't know what he was involved with, with Antonina Irachi's niece, but the fact that there's this really kind of effusive little note in there from the same padre, um, does, does raise some concerns of what, what might've been happening there. So back to the story of Irachis, uh, his, his story at the mission was marked by staggering loss, right? In 1804, at the age of 16, uh, he married a young Tamoy woman, uh, named Quixate, um, but she died about three years later in 1807 and they didn't have any children. And then two years later, Irachis remarries, uh, this time to a woman named Kosorom. Uh, and she was probably from a village very close to his in that same kind of area there. Um, and they had a son, Benvenuto. Um, but unfortunately, the son, uh, Benvenuto, didn't uh, survive very long. He died like about a month after being born, so almost stillborn. Uh, and again, thinking back to these numbers, it's not surprising, but it's, it's, that's the situation happening there at the mission. Um, and so 10 weeks after the death of his child, his wife also dies, Kosaron. Um, and so he was widowed twice, uh, and then he did remarry a third time um, to a woman who had just arrived at the mission from the Aushantaka village, um, just at the other end of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, but she died about five years after their marriage. Um, so he was widowed three times. Um, and, you know, his, the death of his three wives and his son within an 18-month period, right? It was a very short time period. Uh, must have devastated him. Uh, doesn't appear, appear to have married uh, since then. Um, and in fact, he kind of disappears from the mission records for a little period of time, about 10 years. Um, but like many others who are kind of persevering through this difficult, difficult time, uh, he turned to kind of kinship relations uh, and ends up living, you know, he reappears uh, in the 1830s uh, where he's living there with an Achistaka man named uh, Samaktoy. Uh, and then another, uh, the, the man's wife uh, is actually from the Chapuktak village too, right? So. When you look at their, their actual tribal affiliations, their families, you can see that there's this pattern where people are kind of moving in with family. Um, anyway, not surprising at all, but very interesting to see how that continues. Um, on the west side of Santa Cruz, this is a map um, originally kind of built by the late Edna Kimbrough, who has done a lot of important uh, historical work in Santa Cruz. But um, this is, uh, so it's an overlay of a modern map, but on the west side of, uh, this is kind of downtown Santa Cruz around the mission. Uh, when the mission finally closed in 1839, um, there were two, uh, the lands were supposed to be given over to native people. And of course this never really happened or very rarely happened, I should say. Um, and most of the lands have been given over to like the Castros and to a lot of these other families, prominent families in the area. Um, but there's two communities that uh, arise Right, you know, right adjacent to the mission, uh, and this is the Rancho Rio de las Fuentes, um, which is uh, on the west side. The people who know the rancho there eventually gets named the Three Eyes of Water, right after the springs, uh, and that's what the Rancho Rio de las Fuentes, right, Fuentes of Fountains. Uh, so it's a reference to the springs on the west side. Uh, the other one is the Petro de la Huerta, which is the um, orchards behind the mission. And that's the area that becomes known as the Petrero for many years. That's what's known as the reservation up until the 1880s, 1890s, uh, for a long time afterwards. Um, but Rojas ends up living with, uh, with kind of the local Ohlone peoples on this west side, uh, somewhere on the west side over there uh, during this time period. Um, let's see. Uh, he ends up, you know, the people he was living with, they end up passing away 18, uh, you know, little 1820s. And he goes on to live with another guy, Gabriel, 
uh, who is another Al um person, right? Uh, so it's like you can see where they're still kind of living among, uh, you know, tribal cousins, you know, basically relatives uh, for, you know, at least until 1845s, if not a little bit longer. Um, there's a, uh, this is kind of a hand-drawn map from the Kimbrough archives. I don't know if you can see it much. It's, it doesn't have a lot, but I found it really interesting. Kimbrough was kind of tracing out um, the, uh, so more story about Rojas appears in 1860s when there's some land uh, trials that are happening to, um, basically for the Californios who own lands and ranchos, they had to go uh, defend their rights to the lands uh, in the courts, right? In the American courts. And, uh, and in the, the land case that had to do with the West Side, right, the Tres Ojos de Agua, uh, there's a lot of questions. There's a really long uh, interview files and really interesting interviews because they're asking people about some of the native people in the area. Uh, Geronimo is one of the big people who gets talked about a ton there. Uh, I talk a lot about him in my fifth chapter. His story is fascinating too. Um, but Rojas appears there too. They talk about Rojas living in a shack by himself. Uh, and Edna was trying to figure out, it's probably a little bit down uh, you know, from Major's land. Uh, for those who know kind of the West Side. Uh, anyway, uh, just a side note on trying to trace him. But, you know, um, by the late 1870s, uh, Irachis is probably in his 80s at this point, right? And he's, he's living in a makeshift dwelling, probably uh, somewhere near the San Lorenzo at that point, uh, or even back in the Potrero, it seems likely. And this is when he starts having the health issues and showing up at the, the Sisters of Mercy uh, that we started with the story here. Um, and, you know, it, he does, uh, I think the, an interesting note that I, I recently found, too, is that in one of the um, Santa Cruz Enterprise is a, is a local newspaper that was more of a, um, it was a newspaper that was uh, geared towards uh, uh, basically like anti-alcohol, right, uh, the movement. It's a very interesting newspaper as you read through these stories. But they had a little blurb in there where they say that uh, in, in March, uh, actually March 5th of 1875, um, is when, uh, and I have a photo of it, but uh, the article here, but it talks about how there was a fire apparently at his house um, and he almost died of uh, smoke inhalation is what they talk about. Um, but it, it probably took more of a toll than they even realized in this because it was a week later uh, that he died. And you know, the interesting thing uh, that I had no idea going into this uh, when we first, I started making this talk, but uh, when I looked at the date, so Rojas actually died on March 12th uh, of 1875, which is today's date, right? March 12th. Uh, but 100 and, uh, it was 147 years ago uh, today is actually the day that he died. Um, so, you know, by the time, uh, you know, he ends up there, uh, you know, he's, I mean, when you see his real life story and what really happened to him, um, I think it's a lot more compelling. This is a little picture. Uh, the Ma has his Kamal, right? Which is interesting in itself uh, and kind of fascinating, but it's uh, here on display uh, at the museum um, that they ended up with. But, you know, it's, uh, I think the interesting thing about this is that, uh, well, there's a lot of interesting things about this, but, you know, overall, the story of Arachis, the story of Rojas is really a story of perseverance, of strength, uh, in the face of tremendous loss, right, and devastation. Um, the stories of indigenous peoples, you know, stand in stark contrast, the actual histories of people stand in such contrast to these fantasies or these romanticized projections, right? And again, it bears repeating, but these projections were justifications of, uh, of genocide, right? They're justifications of colonialism, of, you know, the disruption that happen, happened here, right? It's a way to romanticize this disappearing race of people uh, to, in order to justify this. Um, but the true stories are, are, of course, much more interesting, right? These, these old stories, they emphasize ancient Indians, uh, the last of their kind, right? This is the tropes that come out of this. Uh, um, but if you look at the actual stories of this, what we see is, is kind of the opposite of this. Instead of it being the vanishing Indian, instead of it being people who are disappearing, uh, what you have today is Native people are still here today, right? Um, here in Santa Cruz, you have people like the Amamutsin, um, you have, you know, the folks over at Indian Canyon, you have the Rometo Shaloni who are just north of here along the coast, uh, the Muwekma, um, the Tamian Nation, uh, the con Confederated Villages of Lishan uh, over in the East Bay. So there are many, many, there's multiple Rumsen tribes. So there are many people who are still here today and they are here because 
of their families, right? The resiliency, the strength of their communities uh, to be able to push through this. Uh, and I think that's that's the the most compelling thing of this, right? We have this narrative of this this vanishing, uh, when the truth is actually about persistence and about about their strength and ingenuity to survive. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And we do have some time for question and answer. So, yes. Mentioned about the uh, minister that actually killed somebody, or about killed himself. You're talking about the the priest who who was killed, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, I didn't I didn't talk about him in this talk, but uh, my whole third chapter is about Padre Quintana, so is, is who he's referencing. And yeah. Quintana was a a very abusive padre who was known for having like wire tips put onto a whip so yeah. that he could cut deeper yeah. with people. Um, and there's this fascinating story of uh, Native people who, uh, men and women who got together and, you know, strategized how to assassinate him. Uh, and that story is, is fascinating on so many levels, including there's a woman, Yakenansa, who uh, is at the heart of this. She's the one who comes up with the strategy. She kind of imports this from elsewhere. Uh, and she's the one who makes it happen at the time, right? And I think that's important to note, too, because for indigenous communities, in California and in the Bay, they were not patriarchal like the Spanish society, right? Native women could and did have positions of power, did have political and spiritual uh, kind of holding, you know, they, they had power and influence. And that persisted into the missions, right? Even despite the, the patriarchal society that was imposed upon them. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I didn't talk about them this time, but there's right. definitely, read chapter three is, uh, <laughs> it gets into a bunch of it. Yeah, Takashi. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. Oh, how to spell, oh, the tribe, the Huineran. Ah, ah, I see from the map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, that, that map in particular was one that I, I made in collaboration with. It's, it's built on a, Randy Milliken has a similar map that he used in uh, Time of Little Choice. Um, but I was updating it and trying to kind of get a better sense because he used more like the villages. You know, it's really complex. Native people were known by many different ways as their tribe, as their family and kind of kinship group. Um, moieties often, but also like their villages. So trying to trace back and understand the, the geography is really complex. And that particular map, I think that was feedback from the Amamutsin tribal chairs, Ed Ketchum. Uh, and Ed Ketchum is, is a brilliant man. He, he's the grandson of uh, Maria Ascension uh, Solarsano, who is the famous uh, woman who was interviewed by Harrington and left thousands of notes. So her grandson is a tribal historian. And uh, I was really, uh, you know, I shared my dissertation with Ed um, after I finished. And he gave me like page by page notes, everything I got wrong, and uh, <laughs> which is a lot of things. And uh, it was really helpful. It was really tremendous. And so I worked with him in the writing this book. I'd send him emails and call him and say, hey, what do you think of this? And so that in particular, the the geographies of that Watson Mill area was, that was what he felt very strongly was how it was. And uh, I, I don't know that area. It's, it's, that's an area that it's really hard to figure out. Like there's the name Cullen Daruk, um, yeah, which some people say, yeah. yeah. And some people say that that may be the name of a, it, it, it means the ocean homes, right? Yeah. Rook means homes and Cullen is, Kalenda is the ocean. Um, but I've heard other people say that that was the name of that whole bay. It was called Kalendaruk. Um, and it's it's hard to know. You know, it's 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 possible that there was also a village and the name of the bay. So the names could be used in this way. Um, but yeah, I'm sure these these maps will continue to evolve too. Yeah. The answer is not sure yet. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we'll ever know for sure exactly. But um, But yeah. That's a name that, that appeared in quite a few of those old records though. So yeah. yeah thank you. Sure. Hey, absolutely. Other questions? Yeah. Any indication what Little Hassan is actually Rocky Mountain? Like what does name mean or something? What, what was his pre's his, name? Yeah, his his native name was Irachis. Oh. So that's the name that's spelled with the uh, Y R A C H I S. 
Yeah, that was the native name. Yeah, so they a lot of times would have the native names in the baptismal registries and things like this. Um, so yeah, so his name was. I know it's kind of interesting. I was just thinking about how it kind of sounds like Rojas Rachis. I mean, I don't know. There's some similarity. It makes me wonder to what extent are people picking names because it has a similarity or something to it. it as a tribal name. Yeah, and it is. Yeah, that is his his name from that. Uh, we'll see, Cherry. Then I'll go back over there. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so the research, I mean, I really, I started with the, those baptismal registries. So there are thousands and thousands on, you know, baptisms, marriages, confirmations, burials, uh, all these, but they, they really, those records are, are just really interesting, right? I mean, it's on one hand, it's the priests who are literally enumerating every person and keeping track because they were trying to find, you know, who's missing and they've got them all by numbers. Um, but at the same time, even though this is how I think of it, the Spanish, it was a Spanish hand writing these records, but they were informed by native people, right? And so the information on these records is, you know, indicative of family kinship networks of like, you know, ties. And there's, there's often little things. One little side note is, um, there's a, a person I write about quite a bit and he comes in from the Yokuts tribes, uh, and his name is, uh, Coleto is the Spanish name. Uh, but in the in the book, he's written as Malamin. Now, this is a guy who he ends up working with the priests. He's tracking down fugitives and doing this. And Ed pointed out to me, he said, his name, Malamin, is is very similar to the word for coyote in Witson language. Uh, and so he says, given what he goes on to do in his role, he's like, is it possible that it was a Mutsin enumerator who says, yeah, his name is Malamin? You know, and so there's ways that I think that if we read it the right way, that there is really fascinating information of ways that people could even, are, are very possibly kind of influencing the way that these records are kept to preserve certain information, right? That he was coyote to the Mutsun people, which would really make a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, so I worked on those. Uh, thousands of records kind of created uh, what I call a database. It's really Excel sheet, like just with many, many different connections. But uh, yeah, I was able to, that's what I started with. It's like tracing out the families and the individuals and the stories. Uh, and then that allowed me, like when I came to the, the oral history about the Quintana assassination, he mentioned some of the names. So I was able to trace through them and say, okay, who would these people have been? And then I realized, oh, they're all connected. Like there's a whole extended kinship network. Um, people are, you know, um, this guy was a godparent to this guy, you know, uh, and there are even family members who are involved in that. So so that was kind of my my methodology there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me go back here and I'll come back to TJ. Yeah. Yeah, you. Uh, the names that are the native names, they are transliteration in Spanish. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great clarification. So sometimes people will ask, like, how do you pronounce, like, for example, the one that gets asked all the time is the tribe that lived in Santa Cruz was called the Uipi. And people say, how do you pronounce that? Well, I mean, that's a good question, right? But I, it was written as U-Y-P-I, and it was written by the missionaries who were speaking Spanish, right? So think of it that way. as like when you see these names, pronounce them as if they were a Spanish word, right? And follow those rules, and that's probably how. But again, they're, they're transliterations, right? They're exactly that. They're being transcribed. And so they appear differently. Like they have, you know, like a, a village name, the suffix tak or taka, is a name means home of or like place of, right? And so many village names, Sayantak, uh, Chaluktaka, you know, show up like this. Um, but sometimes, you know, there's like some that just go ta, and you realize well, maybe they weren't hearing the taka at the end, or you know, anyway, little things like that. But yeah, good question, TJ. Yeah, thanks so much for your presentation. I'm wondering if um, the work of correcting history and ultimately leads to writing reparations. Um, and as you know, there's a whole Land back movement um, uh, led by indigenous people across the America. Do you consider what reparations um, looks like in our area? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Um, I think it's a great question, obviously, um, and a really important one, right? As as people here probably know, um, you know. <laughs> 
like the Amawutsun is the closest uh, kind of large tribe with, with ancestry tracing back here. Uh, but almost none of the tribal members are able to live here, right? Um, Santa Cruz, I don't have to tell you all, it's a very expensive place to live. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, there's this question, you know, uh, the tribal chair, Valentin Lopez, you know, he comes in and works very closely with a lot of things here. I mean, he's driving back and forth from, you know, Sacramento area all the time. And, um, you know, I think that's, you know, mission, the people who went through the missions, not just here, but pretty much across California with a few exceptions, uh, do not have land bases, right? They don't have, you know, places that they can be. They're not federally recognized because of the way that system is all set up. Um, and so, yeah, there's huge problems with this. I think, um, one thing that I think about is, you know, um, you know, the church, Catholic church is one of the largest landowners in the world, but also in California. Um, and, you know, think about the history of the missions in the 1820s, when, uh, under the Mexican, you know, uh, revolution, right. Uh, when Mexico became a nation, one of the first things they did was they pushed back on colonial institutions, right? Like the church, for example. And so all throughout Mexico and Latin America, right? At that point in the 1820s, the churches were being asked to turn over their lands to native peoples, right? And so that was the rule, the law here in California. And like I said earlier, that obviously did not get followed, right? It just almost didn't happen at all. And what happened is large land grants started going out to these wealthy families right. in the area, right? And so the church did give up those lands. And what people don't realize is that the reason that the church owns so much of the mission lands today, they own 18 of the 21 missions in California, um, but they petitioned it. Uh, some of the uh, Catholic church members, clergy, uh, clergy petitioned the president back uh, Lincoln. Lincoln was one of the presidents who gave back a lot of these lands. And so the reason that a lot of the mission lands are still owned by the church isn't because they've always owned them. It's actually because they were given back to them in the 1860s, right? So um, I think that's a great question. I think, uh, you know, it would be great to see, you know, I know from conversations that, you know, some church, uh, contemporary church members are worried that, you know, these stories are damaging for for this history. And I think, I mean, my suggestion is, you know, well, there's a lot of land that could be given back, right? I mean, there's, why not, you know, do take steps towards, uh, you know, making amends for that. I think that seems like a good idea to me. That's what reparations I would think would start with, you know, yeah. Um, there's going to be a, a workshop on May 10th at Fry Ranch with mm. the Amundsen and Land Trust um, talking about that question around land and repatriation. And what we're looking at at Fry Ranch is how to put our memorandum of understanding with the Amundsen into a cultural easement that was run with the need so that the tribe at least had access um, in perpetuity for ceremony, for gathering, hopefully housing. Uh, so that's what we have going to be talking about that day. Yeah, nice. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, do any of the Native American languages exist before? Uh, in living form? And secondly, what was the population before the, um, the missions? And was it affect, how was it affected by disease with you know, people coming into the neighborhood? Yeah, so there's two questions there. The first one is... Um, I'm sorry, remind me again, I got the language, right. So the question was, you know, are the languages still in existence? So, you know, there's a, um, uh, a linguist that I'm, I know of down at UC Riverside, um, Wesley Leonard, uh, who is from the Miami tribe, right, out in kind of Southeast U.S. But he, he writes, his work is really fascinating. And he argues that, um, that you think of languages as being in hibernation rather than extinction. Uh, because they can't come back and they do come back. And I think uh, he worked very closely with actually the creating of the, the Mutsun Dictionary, which was put together. And I think that's a great example because the Solar Sano, who I mentioned, she died in 1930 and she was known as the last fluent Mutsun speaker. Um, but right now I know the Amo Mutsun, I know other uh, local folks are working to kind of relearn the language, right? So there's a relearning going on. I know there's some uh, some hope and plan to kind of start doing tribal business in the Mutsun language at some point in the future. So, um, so yeah, I think that unfortunately the Waswas language is very little that was recorded of that. That's the language of the people of Santa Cruz specifically. Um, there's only a handful of kind of vocabulary lists. Um, so it's not much there, um, but with the Mutsun language, definitely. And actually kind of a weird side note, but the, um, the person who made the Klingon language for Star Trek, and people might not know, uh, but the person who actually did that, and I'm forgetting his name, 
Uh, Mark what? Okrin, yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. So Mark Okrin was a he was studying the Mutsun language and then he was commissioned to create the, the Klingon language. So that language is is very the Klingon language is basically Mutsun language, uh, which is really bizarre. A weird thing. Uh, but then the other question was, yeah, the population and disease. So, you know, population numbers are are all based on estimates, you know, and, and many people have taken different approaches. Uh, I mean, it's certainly what we look at today is very small numbers. You know, the tribes, there's probably about eight or nine Waswa speaking Ohlone tribes uh, in the area, and they had maybe 200 members each, you know, so it's relatively small uh, groups, you know, that are living there um, at the time. But I mean, thousands, certainly. Um, and those numbers are kind of, people debate those all the time. But the question of disease is an important one. And I think, you know, when I was looking at the demographic loss and everything, Disease is absolutely a part of that story, right? Disease, new diseases, people didn't have immunities for uh, diseases like, uh, you know, smallpox came through diphtheria. There's all sorts of things. But I think it's also important to realize that disease often is exacerbated by bad living conditions. And like the when the, the people traveling through the California missions, they talked about the, uh, in particular, the women's dormitories, the Monjarios they're called, which translates to mean nunnery. But the women were put into these buildings that were always described as being poorly ventilated. They were often like, they said like their cells, like they had one entrance that was locked on the outside um, and no windows, right? And, and so like, you know, how much of disease was a, a product of terrible, terrible uh, living conditions, right? That people weren't used to. Uh, and then I mentioned earlier, you know, the issue of, um, you know, Tabawada and of, uh, in particular, of venereal disease, right? And syphilis. So, uh, you know, some of the diseases are, are, are product of something much more, much worse, right? Um, and uh, sexual abuse that's happening there too. So yes, there's disease on different levels, but I think you have to, there's, there's a context for it too. Um, and the bad conditions too that you know people were were given contributed to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. The question being, are there resources for educators? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I know that there are a handful of things. I know there's some like uh, Bay Area Loney stuff. I do know in Santa Cruz, the up on campus, there's a group uh, in the education department, um, which is uh, Judy Scott and Renya Ramirez and a bunch of really great folks who are, are putting together kind of a curriculum project in collaboration with Alma Woodson. And so um, doing that, I mean, that whole project is really incredible. There's all sorts of cool stuff there. They're doing um, interviews with uh, tribal members. Some of uh, the young uh, Alma Woodson folks, Alexi and Carolyn, uh, in particular, who are, they're both grad students uh, in California here, uh, but they're doing like a whole uh, tribal history where they're recording these things. And uh, so I know that there are plans to kind of create more curriculum alternatives. I think what you're talking about is, as most people know, is, you know, in California, we're taught, is what I was taught to, is this romanticized mission story in the fourth grade. Um, and, and nothing really about the truth, right? It's the same stories that the Franciscan historians uh, put out in the early 1900s that are continue to be taught today. Um, and, you know, there's a, that's a huge issue. And I know there are a lot of people working on it. Uh, it's kind of a slow thing. But, uh, you know, I always think, like, why, you know, why they teach? Because everyone says, well, you can't teach the, the real truth about the missions to fourth graders. I think, okay, well, if it's that young, well, why not wait and teach it when people are older, when they can handle the truth, right? We do teach about things like the Holocaust. Um, we do teach about slavery, right? We teach about uh, a lot of hard, hard, uh, difficult histories, right? And this could be done too, if we just, you know, thought about when we're going to teach it. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are, are continue to work on that important issue, sure. Other questions? Are we, I think we have a few more minutes left. To. Hey, I want to give a shout out to uh, Sea Lion and folks out there, but there's a, a table there with information on the Protect Eurostock uh, movement, which is, uh, there's a, Eurostock is a place over in Gilroy, I'm probably going to get it a little bit wrong where, um, but it's Sergeant Quarry over there. It's, it's being threatened to get turned into a gravel pit. And this area was actually a home of uh, your stock itself means um, it's a place of the Cook Sui, which was one of the really, um, you know, powerful kind of intertribal ceremonies. 
um, that took place, right, uh, pre-contact. And the spiritual leaders from multiple tribes would get together at these certain areas to have this really important ceremony. So it's a, a place of particular kind of spiritual significance. They're spread out, those those spots where the cook sui would happen were kind of spread out. Uh, and so one of the last ones that hasn't been developed is is currently being under threat of development. So, um, you know, anyway, thank you for you guys for tabling. And if people want to get more information, there's a great opportunity right there. Yeah, yeah. Can you just give a brief pause for paying land tax? For who? Paying land tax. For paying land tax, sure, sure. So you know, up in East Bay, um, with uh, with Karina Gould and the uh, Confederated uh, Villages of Lishan, they've started a a uh, voluntary land tax thing. It's called Shumi land tax, uh, where people can uh, you know the money goes into local tribes up there. Uh, it's a great idea. I think uh, I saw two in L.A. There's one in San Fernando that the Tatavium tribe have instituted too, and these are like vol voluntary land taxes. Um, but it, it, anyway, it's, it's kind of an early movement that's starting to grow, but I think it's a important way and something to think about for sure. Yeah. I don't think there's anything like that here yet, but yeah. 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 Can you say anything about what the native people did for livelihood and where they went after the missions and followed? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's, I think, one of the least studied eras is that Mexican national era, right? So 1820 to 1848, California was part of Mexico, right? Alta California. Um, and so the missions closed. Again, it took a long time, right? It was 1839 when when the, the governor of California sent uh, Hartnell to go visit each of the missions to see what's the state of things, right? Have been people have been emancipated, right? That was the language, too. And, um, and they found that they hadn't been. And so when they came to Mission Santa Cruz, that's where Geronimo, he notes, you know, old Geronimo has said he's tired and he wants his lands back. Uh, and he wants to be freed here. And so they finally, people are emancipated from the missions. And, you know, the, they're supposed to be made into citizens in Mexican society. And to some degree they are, but, you know, there's, there's still these little passports that they have to do. There's, there's notice locally. Um, I saw some uh, letter was talking about how Indians couldn't pass over the San Lorenzo without having a permit and a pass to do. So, you know, we talk about that time as being a little bit more mobility and there is, right? Chumash families moving into the area. There's native people moving up and down, you know, throughout the state, but they're also being policed very, very much then too, right? They're being, you know, prohibited from traveling much. And a lot of them end up working on these ranchos, right? Um, and, and that in itself, I mean, again, it's, it's unpaid labor. I mean, they're, they're living at these ranchos. Uh, the dynamics of that, you know, are, are not quite totally clear, but that's where a lot of them went uh, during that time period. Uh, but it's good to keep in mind that right after that, I mentioned earlier, like the policies of genocide. I mean, that starts in 1850, as soon as the, right after the gold rush, right? And so at that point, because of the people coming out of the missions, they speak Spanish, they have, you know, they're living in a similar way to some degree, right, with the Californios who are here. And so in that era is really a time where Native people are often, I hear so many stories from people today talk about how their grandparents told them, hey, it's better to to be Mexican than to be an Indian. So don't tell anyone you're Indian, right? And so, uh, and that and there's a legacy of that still today where a lot of people have that in their families where it's like they were taught, hey, if you want to survive, you have to pretend like you're not an Indian. Um, now, of course, for Latinos in this time period, I mean, we know the lynchings that happen here in Santa Cruz. I mean, it's not much better, but it is a little bit better than being having scalp bounties put on your head um, to be to be slaughtered. So. Um, yeah, but that question of what's happening at a time period is, is a really interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. Any any last questions? Thank you all. Yeah, Bonnie. Yeah, I think you know, a lot of the standard relations stays for our Yeah, no, thanks, Bonnie. And that's 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 a good point. You know, the the Santa Cruz 
the state park that's at the mission, right up on the mission hill there is, is really unique in that all the other mission sites, what stands is the church building, right? And here the church fell in an earthquake in the 1850s. Um, but what stands is native homes. They were built by native people as all the buildings were. Um, but these were built for native people to live in, native families to live in. Um, and so it's always offered a opportunity to tell it a little differently from that native perspective. Uh, and I will say we're right now we're working on a project where we're uh, working with uh, some of the young uh, tribal members uh, today. We're going to record some audio content um, of the story. So we know because of the archaeology done at that site, we know which native families lived in which buildings and which rooms. And so then I've re done a bunch of research on each of them. So. Uh, we know a lot about the specifics of the people who live there and their families. And so we're going to work this summer to kind of build a, a narrative with, uh, you know, tribal members today and have them record stories that people can then kind of go into the park and listen to these stories, which really intersect with uh, so many of the stories around this history. Um, and then that way it offers an opportunity to, to tell kind of a more honest story to, and people can opt to choose into that or not if they, you know, don't feel like it's, it's too adult for their kids or that's a, a choice they can make. Um, but we want to, we want to have that there. So there's all sorts of stuff that we're trying to kind of redo up at the Santa Cruz mission. So yeah, thank you, Bonnie, for that. Yeah. Great. Any last question? Well, thank you.